Good morning, YouTubers. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Who is Heather? That's something that's bothered me a lot. And I know what you're saying. You've said it in many of the comments below. You believe that Heather is either Maddox himself or his girlfriend because you claim to have seen such behavior in the past against Dick Masterson and his girlfriend. But to me, it is just disturbing. Throughout the process, I'm hoping that Heather is a real individual, not the plaintiff of somebody closely associated with the plaintiffs. Because to me, if you read it otherwise, it seems like directly trying to mislead the court. Trying to mislead the court to believe that there was a real journalist who inquired as to the employment status of one of the defendants. This is the case of, of Maddox versus Dick Masterson. For those of you who aren't aware of this particular case, I will leave a link up above to all the different videos in which we discuss this case. This started out as two podcasters who were partners in a podcast some years ago. The partnership broke up, eventually deteriorating into an online fight in which one side seems to have gotten the upper hand. Maddox then files a lawsuit naming not only Dick Masterson, but just about everybody in any way associated with Dick Masterson. In this case, also including a frequent guest of the show by the name of Asterius Kokinos and Asterius Kokinos' employer, Weber Shandwick. Today, we're going to look at Weber Shandwick response to the case. Weber Shandwick is the employer of Asterios, and they're the one who received the mysterious communication from Heather. We're going to go through that, explain what's going on, see if we can get, shed any light on who Heather actually is. By the way, if you have any questions, any concern, leave them down below, or better yet, show up Thursday to the live event, 12 p.m., bring any questions you have. Watch me just follow Hi, my name is Lior Lesser. I'm a tech lawyer, and this this is YouTuber Law. And today we're gonna go through Weber Shandwick's response to the plaintiff. Their response essentially says we want moving to dismiss. And in the process, not only they filed a motion to dismiss, but also a memorandum in support of that motion. And that's what we're really gonna go through, trying to understand the law, the cases, some of the background of what how they're supporting their motion to dismiss. Remember, unlike most of the other defendants who are not located in uh, New York where this case was filed, they can't move to dismiss based on lack of personal jurisdiction. They have to look into the details themselves, into the case themselves, trying to figure out is there any other basis on which to actually file for a motion to dismiss luckily for Weber Shandwick there is ample opportunity largely because there is really no basis for actually suing them and that's what's going to come down to it they're going to tell the court basically assume the facts are true assume everything that the plaintiff is true there's absolutely no claim that can be asserted here. There's no legal basis on which to file a lawsuit. And that's basically how they're going to get uh, the motion to dismiss. It may not happen right away. The court may give the plaintiff an opportunity to amend or add some additional evidence in support of uh, the complaint. But this, uh, this will be the basis on which it will be dismissed because, frankly, there is no real legal basis on which to sue, even if you assume the absolute truth of everything that the uh, plaintiffs are saying. Let's jump right into it. And this is the memorandum of law in support of the motion by defendants Weber Shandwick and Joshua Kaufman to dismiss all claims asserted against them. If you remember, Joshua Kaufman is the in-house counsel for Weber Shandwick. Why is he in his lawsuit? It's not really clear. The asserted claim is that Heather, when she contacted by email Weber Shandwick, she actually communicated with Joshua Kaufman, and as a result, they decided that he has to be a defendant as well here. Preliminary statement. This lawsuit is the latest shot in a long-standing and deeply personal fight between plaintiffs on the one hand and several of the defendants on the other. W.S., Weber Shandwick, and Kaufman have no involvement in that fight and no stake in its outcome, despite plaintiffs' flawed attempt to drag them into this lawsuit. And I think they hit it right on the head. This has nothing to do with them. This is obviously some personal fight between plaintiffs and Dick Masterson, maybe several other people that associated with him, but definitely not Weber Shandwick or Joshua Kaufman. In February 2017, an individual who identified herself only as Heather emailed several executives at WS and copied persons she believed were WS's clients, claiming to be a journalist writing a story on online trolls, bullying, and harassment. Heather's stated goal was to see if companies like WS would hold employees like Kikinos accountable for online statements. Kaufman requested more information before responding to Heather's question, but the anonymous writer refused to provide any. And in the midst of that one paragraph, we get a little footnote, which is very, very interesting. Let's take a look at it. We note that Heather's email contained an outdated address for Condé Nest, misspelled the, that address as 4 
Tim's square, misspell Condenest as Condenest, and give a general Condenest phone number as Heather's phone number. WS is not aware of any articles regarding Coquinos in any Condenest publication or any other publisher other than articles reporting on the present lawsuit. And from that alone, you can see why WS will be concerned and may want some background information on the journalist before providing any sort of official statement. After all, there are misstatements, misspellings, there's wrong phone numbers. The complaint is riddled with legal deficiencies and failed to state any cognizable claim against W.S. or Kaufman. And the complaint should be dismissed as to those two defendants. Now let's jump into some of the facts associated with this case. The party, Plaintiff George Azunian, Azunian is a writer and internet personality. Plaintiff Jane Doe is Azunian's girlfriend, but Doe is identified by her internet moniker in the complaint, and a simple internet search reveals Doe true identity in a matter of seconds. Why are you identifying anybody as a Jane Doe if you're going to reveal her in the complaint itself and actually makes it so simple because after all she's an internet personality herself. This lawsuit is at least the third legal action between Ozunian and Doe on the one hand and Herrera and his girlfriend on the other. Doe is currently the subject of a restraining order issued in Los Angeles, California based on allegations that Doe threatened and harassed a girlfriend of defendant Herrera and ex-girlfriend of Azunian, Marie Velanzuela, the publicly available files show that similar to plaintiff's action in this case, described in more detail below, Doe, or someone on her behalf, threatened to contact the school where Venezuela is employed as a teacher and make baseless allegations against her. Doe followed through on her threat on or about May 4th, 2017. So you can see why WS sees a parallel between the calls they received from Heather about their own employee Coquinos and what has already happened in Los Angeles for which there is a restraining order against Jane Doe. After reviewing the information, the Superior Court of California issued a restraining order against Doe. All they're trying to show at this point is that there's been ongoing fighting between these parties and it has absolutely nothing to do with WS. US or Joshua Kaufman. The complaint is replete with allegations that harassment and other egregious conduct occurred well before the day that WS or Kaufman allegedly should have known of Kokinos' online activity. Although many of the allegations do not specifically name Kokinos as a perpetrator, he's generally lumped in with the other defendants and the complaint seeks to attribute liability to him as part of the defendant group. And that's true, we spoke about it many times before. Usually, all the defendants are being grouped together, so you have no idea who they're saying actually did anything. Who wrote anything if you're saying all the defendants? Does that include W.S. and Joshua Kaufman? Is it just Kokinos? Is it one of the other half dozen or so defendants? There's never real clarity about that. Each of these examples illustrate the harassment allegedly occurred before February 22, 2017, the date in, on which the complaint alleges that W.S. and Kaufman were on notice of the harassment by Kokinos as W.S.'s employee. And the complaint does not allege that W.S. or Kaufman knew or should have known of these actions when they occurred. Very good point. Point. I mean, the heart of why they're trying to draw W.S. and Joshua Kaufman into this lawsuit is the idea that Heather put uh, the company and their in-house counsel on notice of what their employee was doing. And assume whether they have sort of any sort of responsibility to stop it whatsoever, they, having given notice, should have done something to stop it. Now, that depends on when you assert that they have notice. And if you show that everything that you're complaining of happened before the Heather ever called WS or, or spoke by email to Joshua Kaufman, how can you claim that they were put on notice if they were put on notice after everything that you allege actually happened. The complaint alleges that W.S. and Kaufman were notified of Kokinos' harassment of the plaintiff on or about February 22, 2017. On that date, an individual giving her name as Heather emailed W.S. that Kokinos is taking part in an online harassment and bullying campaign targeting individuals and seeking comments. The email and subsequent email were sent from a Gmail address. You would think that a reporter for whom identification is important and credibility is important would use the email provided by their publisher, La Condonest in this case, and not Gmail. Heather claimed to be a journalist working for Condonest Media Group regarding online trolls, bullying, and harassment. Heather did not identify herself or identify the individuals that allegedly were targets of the harassment and bullying campaign. Heather did not claim to be a target of harassment herself. So Heather contacts you. She's not saying she is a victim. She's saying there's some allegations of some people potentially being victims, 
and yet doesn't give you any sort of example, doesn't identify them directly, but doesn't even give you broad examples of the category of the kind of people that were targeted. On February 23rd, 2017, Kaufman responded to the initial email from Heather and requested her complete contact detail to speak with her directly concerning her email. So within one day, she receives a response saying, Tell us who you are. On February 25, 2017, Heather requested a statement from WS, and two days later, Kaufman replied again requesting her contact information as WS needed to verify the identity of any reporter before making a statement on the record. Now, I have no doubt that there is a policy like that. They have to verify who the person is before giving some official statement, but I am sure that they had lots of suspicion that whoever Heather is, she's not who she's purporting to be. In response, Heather did not provide further contact details or information regarding the individuals allegedly subject to Kokinos' harassment, but instead asked Kaufman to identify companies who worked with Kokinos in order to reach out to them directly about Kokinos. So a purported journalist who uses a private email provided substantial amount of mistakes in the address, in the phone number, in uh, the spelling of her own employer, does not want to provide any real identifying information, just using her first name as Heather, now says, okay, rather than give you information, give me the details about all your clients that your employee works with, because I'm going to contact them directly. I mean, does that even sound sane to anybody? She further stated that if Kaufman was unwilling to give a statement because of the relative anonymity of the piece, that is understandable. And she is not just a journalist, but an activist. Now, what was the purpose of saying, I'm not just a journalist, but an activist. If you are writing a piece, if you want a credibility, you would stick to the idea that you're a journalist. But adding that you're an activist, now you're trying to make that company fearful. Because as an activist, you might get people riled up against them. Now, that makes no sense because just the opposite. If you're now identifying yourself as an activist, you removed all credibility that you're some impartial journalist. And now they need to be very, very careful about ever speaking to you again. Not a very smart move here. Plaintiffs allege that Heather's anonymous and error-written communication put W.S. Kaufman on notice of Kokino's allegedly unlawful conduct toward the plaintiff. Arguably, you have put them on notice. The question is, what notice have you put them on? If I'm the in-house counsel for Weber Shandwick, I'm thinking that I'm being put on notice here that somebody is trying to do something funny and I, I need to be very, very protective of my company. Kokino's alleged conduct after February 22nd, 2017. So now they're asking, okay, if I was put on notice on February 22nd, let's see what my employee did after I was put on notice. Plaintiffs claim that after receiving notice on or about February 22nd, W.S. and Kaufman had a duty to investigate but did nothing. Yet contrary to the allegation, the complaint also alleged W.S. and Kaufman took action in response to Heather's email because it alleged that defendants somehow breached a duty to plaintiff by investigating and telling Kokinos about Heather's complaint and allegedly disclosing plaintiff's identities. Which is a smart catch by W.S.'s attorney. They're saying, well, you're claiming that I had a duty to do something about it because you told me about my employee's behavior and that I didn't do anything or I didn't do substantially enough. But at the same time, you're saying that once I started investigating, I actually told the defendant that something is happening here. I told my employee about the call and as a result, I breached a duty to you. So am I breaching my duty if I don't do anything or if I'm doing something I'm breaching my duty because I'm running an investigation that you don't find to be sufficient or am I breaching my duty because in, as part of my investigation I start questioning my employee about their own behavior as a result they learn about the investigation. Which one is the breach? Plaintiff's claims are remarkable because the emails attributed to Heather in the complaint never identified Heather or the individual subject to the alleged harassment. And then you're complaining about the fact that I revealed the investigation. But how could I have revealed who gave me that information? How can I reveal you as the plaintiff since Heather is never identified? Heather is not claimed to be a plaintiff. Heather is not claimed to be a victim. There's no real information about Heather. When Heather was, was asked to provide some contact information, she never provided anything in return. So how can you say that I breached a duty to Heather who contacted me when in fact I had no idea who Heather was according to your complaint. The complaint alleges that in retaliation for Heather's complaint, Kokinos continued to harass plaintiffs up after February 22nd, 2017 and made everything worse for the plaintiff. So we skip over the fact that I was contacted by somebody named Heather and I started an investigation and told my employee that he's being investigated and I'm going to look into this. 
Now you allege that even though I didn't know who Heather was, even though Heather is not one of the victims, in telling my employee that there is an investigation, somehow things got worse for you as the plaintiff, even though there is no allegation that Heather ever identified you as uh, anybody who was a victim. You were never part of the victim class. So there was no way for me to connect the two. At least that's what you say through the complaint. Now let's get into the actual argument regarding the motion to dismiss. All of the claims against W.S. and Kaufman must be dismissed for failure to allege negligence. Each of the claims against W.S. and Kaufman allege some form of negligence. To state a claims arising from negligence, a complaint generally must allege the defendant owed the plaintiffs a duty of reasonable care, the breach of that duty, and that such breach was the proximate cause of the plaintiff's injury. And that was the strangest thing of all. Why would you think that Weber Shandwick has any sort of responsibility toward you because some alleged journalists called them that they couldn't verify? Here the complaint does not allege any relationship between W.S. or Kaufman on the one hand and plaintiffs on the other, let alone any relationship that would, would impose a duty of care to plaintiff. According to the complaint, W.S. and Kaufman were never aware of plaintiff's identities or any other details regarding plaintiff. The complaint therefore asserts that W.S. and Kaufman owe a duty of care to police the private non-work related activities on the internet of persons who happen to be W.S. employees and to conduct an investigation in a way that somehow does not alert those employees when an unknown member of the general public complains about the private non-work activities. So you tell me that anytime anyone that I can't even really identify calls me and tells me and forewarns me about the activities of one of my employees, I'm obligated to start an investigation. I'm obligated to run that investigation in a way that doesn't alert them to the fact that there is an investigation. And even though I have no idea that some third parties are in any way connected to whoever actually called me and I really can't identify that person, I now owe a duty not only to the unidentified person who called me, but also to the unidentified third parties uh, some way related to the unidentified person who called me. Two, the complaint does not allege any assumed duty. The complaint contends that W.S. and Kaufman voluntarily assumed a duty by undertaking to perform an act for the plaintiff's benefit. So even if you assume that there is no inherent duty of care here, you are saying that by the mere fact that I started talking to you, that I started investigating, I now owe you something. I owe you a certain kind of behavior. To establish a duty by voluntary assumption, the defendant must undertake to perform an act for the plaintiff's benefit, and that act must then be performed without due care for the safety of the plaintiff. So here they're saying that in order to say that I assumed a duty by doing something for your benefit, you'd have to explain how I would do that if I you were never identified. If you were ne never identified at the third party by the individual Heather who herself was not really corroborated as an identity. It is nonsensical to assert that W.S. or Kaufman took action to benefit unnamed individuals about whom no details were provided in response to email from another unknown individual who refused to identify herself. Duh. Second, Heather's emails to Kaufman show that she did not request that W.S. or Kaufman assist plaintiffs or otherwise take any action for their benefit. So Heather never identified the plaintiff and never asked that anything would be done for their benefit. Neither did Kaufman promise help in his response, which are quoted in the complaint. So how can you say that merely by saying, we take this matter seriously and please provide corroborating information about yourself, that is in a way of assuming duty against unidentified third parties. Finally, the complaint alleges that W.S. and Kaufman's response to Heather's email stands in the face of public representation made by the company regarding civility and trolling. And then there's some allegation, very, very vague, that is part of their PR, W.S. espouses uh, civility online, and that somehow their behavior in this case is in complete contrast to their PR. If that actually mattered or not, here, WS goes into detail showing why that's not really what was happening, that what they were doing through their PR had nothing to do with what was alleged here. It's, it's interesting, but it's not uh, important. This is complete nonsensical stuff that's being thrown at them. Plaintiffs also fail to state a claim for negligence based on assumed duty because plaintiffs do not allege detrimental reliance on Kaufman's alleged action. In order for a party to be negligent in the performance of an assumed duty, the plaintiffs must have known of and detrimentally relied on plaintiffs' performance. So don't forget, these plaintiffs 
are the unidentified third party that WS didn't know about. So how could somebody who was not identified, that WS did not know existed, didn't know the identities of, be relying on what WS did or didn't do? Even assuming for argument's sake that WS and Kaufman owed a duty of care to the plaintiff, the complaint does not adequately allege that WS or Kaufman acted without reasonable care in breach of the duty. So now for the sake of argument, we're going to assume that WS had some sort of a duty toward the plaintiff. Were their actions reasonable? The complaint alleges that following Heather's email to Kaufman, which reported that Kokinos was engaged in online harassment after hours against unidentified person, WS notified defendant Kokinos of the complaint and otherwise failed to adequately conduct an investigation into the matter. But it is absurd to assert that WS and Kaufman should have or even could have conducted some sort of investigation without speaking to Kokinos. And the complaint asserts no allegation in support of its conclusion that W.S. and Kaufman conducted an inadequate investigation. So if the argument is that their actions were inadequate, well, first of all, somebody that wasn't identified contacts us to complain about actions against some unidentified person. Do you think it's reasonable for us to start talking to Kokinos, to our own employee, see what his side is? In fact, the complaint's allegation strongly implied that W.S. and Kaufman did take adequate action. Prior to Heather's emails, the complaint alleges that Kokinos and others threatened plaintiffs with death and threats, disrupted plaintiffs' corporate sponsorship, and disclosed private information about plaintiffs to their fans. Following Heather's emails and whatever action W.S. and Kaufman allegedly took in response to those emails, the complaint alleges only that Kokinos complained that his employer had been contacted, discussed writing a book out of spite, and attempted to create an advertising campaign on social media platform against Uzunian. So the argument is that we didn't take adequate action. Once we were notified of what Kokinos did, we didn't do enough to stop it. Things just got worse. But by your own complaint, things seem to have gotten a little better, didn't they? Before that, people were attacking you, uh, threatening you with rape, maybe even death. It was online harassment. Your sponsors and advertisers were leaving. After you claimed that we ran an investigation and contacted Coquinos and actually uh, told him about the investigation, you're not complaining about much. You said that he went online and said that he knows about it, that he's going to write a book in sp to spite you and potentially run an advertisement campaign against you. Compare that to death threats and uh, rape threats to your, uh, compare that to your, all your sponsors leaving you. Didn't things get a little better? A necessary element of any negligence claim is that defendant's alleged negligence caused the plaintiff's alleged injury. The complaint's own allegation, however, established the absence of any such causation with respect to W.S. and Kaufman. The complaint itself establishes that even if W.S. and Kaufman negligently supervised Kokinos or negligently investigated Heather's allegations against Kokinos, plaintiffs would have been subject to vitriolic harassment from Herrera and others. See, at this point, we have to prove causation. We, let's assume that we had a duty toward you and then we failed in that duty. Now you have to say that our failure here cause you damage but you showed nothing where what we did or failed to do actually caused you damage because the only time you actually identified things that caused you damage they were done by either other defendants or by their fans not by us ne you never showed how if we stopped this this would never have happened that we caused damage and our failure of duty here cause damage. Although the complaint speculates that Kokinos may have used WS's computers to access those platforms, he just as easily could have done so through his own computer or phone. And if the complaint is that we had access to the equipment that he was using, that he used our computers, our phone system, well, he could have easily used his own phone, his own computer system, he could easily have gone to a, to a, in a library and used it. There is no indication that even if we stopped usage of our equipment, the harm that you're claiming could have ever been stopped. So what do you think? To me, it seems that Weber Shandwick's uh, attorneys did really a, a good job in dismantling the entire complaint. They didn't have the luxury of just arguing about lack of personal jurisdiction. They had to get into the meat of the complaint. And they did so by showing that even if we assume everything was true, every single allegation that uh, the plaintiffs made are absolutely true, there's no legal claims on which to proceed. 
doesn't many doesn't matter that you don't like what the what the individuals did or failed to do. There are no legal actions against them. Nothing that the court can help you, and that's why it needs to be dismissed. I hope you find it informative. I hope you enjoyed. If you have any questions, any concerns, anything you want to talk about, just leave them down below. I'd love to talk to you. I'll see you next time. Touch me. Let me know you wanted to. Don't tell what you need.